as you can see from the slide here, we're actually going to go over two parables that I've entitled housewife parables because Jesus covered all of his bases. He didn't want anyone to be lost. So he preached to fishermen. He preached to tax collectors. He preached to soldiers. And back when a lot of women were neglected, he made sure to tell some parables that would especially appeal to them. So even if you're not a woman, these are parables that teach great truths about the kingdom. Hello, of God. I'm there. So I'm uh, sure I'm, I'm sure that there. I'm sure that this will be something that we can all relate to. So many of these parables are repeated several times in scripture, but tonight we're just going to look at them from one gospel. That way we can focus more on them, their historical context, and what it has for us today. So we'll do a quick review, and then we'll look at the history of Jewish women. We'll look briefly at the parable of the coin, and then we'll look at some of the history of leaven or of bread, and then the parable of the leaven. So this will probably be for the next 45 minutes or so. As you can see, there's approximately 39 parables. Um, there possibly could be more. They're spread out through the first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John actually doesn't include any parables. It has been said that the first three parables talk about the history of salvation, and John covers the mystery of salvation. And they're grouped into helpful little categories here. So you can see that some deal with forgiveness or others deal with prayer or the kingdom of God. And tonight we're going to look at two in particular that further discuss the kingdom of God. Now, this is a very handy book I have found here on the right-hand side. Looking at his last name here, I can assume it's a Jewish man who became a Christian and it's an older text, but he goes through different parts of Jewish life and he sheds some light on the historical context. So when I looked at chapter on Jews and the chapter on Jewish women in particular, this is a little bit about what Alfred had to say. He said compared to other societies back then, women could actually mingle a lot more freely at home and abroad. Um, there were some parts of Greek where women could not be out in public unless they were accompanied by a man. And in other parts of Greek, some of them just stayed in the house their entire lives. Once they got married, they never left again. But it wasn't necessarily like that in ancient Israel. Women, as you can see here, got to mingle a lot more freely. In other societies, they were very much oppressed. There was only a few societies where they had basic human rights. But in Judaism, they were actually elevated. They had a very special role in the home and the church and in society. And although they didn't have the same rights of men, as men, there's many times in scriptures where they were prophetesses, where they were judges, uh, especially the early Christian church. Many of them had a prominent position of influence. And I like what the author says here. He said, Above all, we are wholly spared those sickening details of private and public immorality with which contemporary classical literature abounds. Among Israel, women were pure, the home happy, and the family hallowed by a religion. So when you read Greek mythology and Roman mythology, the women are generally scandalous. They're mating with the gods. They're stabbing their husbands. They're doing things they shouldn't do. But when it comes to Jewish literature, even outside of scripture, we don't have any of these sickening, disgusting stories. Sure, it may have happened, but in general, um, Israeli homes are a lot more pure. They're a lot more hallowed. And in general, people were following God. Women back then were given their own free and express consent to a marriage. So Ellen White does tell us that generally the parents would arrange the marriage, but they couldn't force the daughter to get married. Most parents love their children, so obviously they would try to find a mate that would be compatible with their child. But if a woman absolutely refused, she could not be forced to marry the man. They were given dowries, money, property, or jewelry. And the husband was actually supposed to add half more to this if it was money, or four-fifths more if it was jewelry. And some women would like keep this in a box in their house. Other women, they'd have like this turban and they'd put their dowry inside the turban. So sometimes when they walk, it would jingle and it would just kind of show other people how much they were worth. Uh, but a lot of women, particularly if that dowry was incredibly sacred to them, they would hide it away. Um, sometimes they take it out from time to time to look at it. But generally speaking, it was something that was under safekeeping that was very important to them. So when Jesus tells us the parable of the coin, this is something that every single woman could relate to because back then, for the most part, all women had some sort of dowry, whether it was jewelry or whether it was money. 
So now that we had a brief little intro, we're going to jump right into the text. It's Luke chapter 15, verses 8 to 10. So if someone would like to read this, um, what we'll do is we'll read the text, and then we'll read Ellen White's comments, and then we'll open it up for discussion. So Luke chapter 15, 8 to 10, if anyone is willing to read. I have it in front of me. I can start, Ashley. For suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Amen. So before we discuss this, if someone would read Ellen White's comments on the bottom here, because this will shed some historical light on this passage. She said, in the East, houses of the poor usually consisted of but one room, often windowless and dark. The room was rarely swept, and a piece of money falling on the floor would be speedily covered by the dust and rubbish. In order that it might be found, even in the daytime, a candle must be lighted and the house must be swept diligently. The wife's marriage portion usually consisted of pieces of money, which she carefully preserved as her most cherished possession, to be transmitted to her own daughters. The loss of one of these pieces would be regarded as a serious calamity, and its recovery would cause great rejoicing, in which the neighboring woman would readily share. So I don't know about you, but to me, it definitely helps knowing a little bit of the cultural context. So question for you is what stands out about the parable? Is there anything that comes to your mind, anything that you've studied, or anything in particular that you'd like to highlight? Well, the... In order that it might be found, even in the daytime, a candle must be lighted and the house must be swept diligently. The physical was that we clean the floor and we light the candle, but maybe we sweep our lives of sin and light the candle of, of, the, of Christ. Oh, that's Stab such a it. good point. Yeah, because we can't find it if it's if it's like dirty with our own sins, that's a really good point. Yeah, I was actually thinking along the same lines. Um, it's interesting the way she described the house that if the coin fell on the floor, it would be quickly covered by dust. Um, I mean, I don't, I think most people in, you know, Western society don't have houses that are that um, dusty. So I thought that was really interesting, like you said, to have the cultural background to it, but also just like, it, um, you know, what was just said about um, sweeping our lives of sin and, you know, that light being lit so that we're able to see more readily. I think it's also a very good spiritual application. Amen. One, one point of order. Yeah, our house is a bit dusty. We haven't done that in about a year, but we're working on it. <laughs> We also have a lot of references throughout the Bible from going from darkness to lightness and seeing the light. And that's what I equated to with uh, lighting the lamp. Yeah, I never realized the order that this parable was told in because apparently right in front of this parable is the parable of the lost sheep. And that's something very common. Most people are familiar with that. The shepherd goes out to find that one lost sheep and then he brings them back in. And we know that represents Jesus looking for us. And there are a lot of similarities between those parables, but there's also some major differences. And I never noticed the differences and I never noted that Jesus told them in a particular order. So before we look at the order and why Jesus did this, let's just briefly review that parable. If somebody could read Luke 15, 4 to 7, and then we'll talk about what are some similarities between the two parables. Because there's a specific reason why Jesus told the parable of the last sheep and then the parable of the last coin. So whoever would like, if you could read Luke 15, 4 to 7.
that I got in front of me, I can read again. Oh, perfect. Suppose one of you has 100 sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Thank you. So what are some similarities between these two parables? What are some things that stand out? Oh, and Dan, I see your hand is up. Feel free to interject at any time. Uh, right. Um, this uh, this sounds a lot to me like the prodigal son. I'm not sure if that's apropos here or not, but it certainly does. You're looking for the two parables represented different. But the lost coin, and have no sense of their condition. They are strange from God, but unconscious. In the parable, Christ teaches that even those who are indifferent to the claims of God are the objects of his pitying love. They are to be sought for that they may be brought back to God. Sometimes it reminds me of a fool's errand. Uh, I have a problem with shake the dust off your feet and move on. And God's little, little voice that says, no, go for that one. Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. yeah, you bring up a good point, how it's very similar to the prodigal son. And God is searching for everyone here. He's searching for people that know they're lost like the prodigal son um, or like, you know, the lost sheep, the sheep obviously knew it was lost, but something I never realized until I read this chapter was that the coin represents people that don't know they're lost, like people in Christian homes or people in the church or people that just think they're good people that they don't really need a savior. And that's specifically what the parable of the coin is addressing. And Ellen White, of course, has a great way of wording it. So if someone would be willing to read her quotes on the bottom, um, you could read all three bullet points if you don't mind, and then we'll talk about some of the differences between these two parables. I'll read. This parable, like the preceding, sets forth the loss of something which, with proper search, may be recovered, and that with great joy. But the two parables represent different classes. The lost sheep know knows that it is lost. It has left the shepherd and the flock, and it cannot recover itself. It represents those who realize that they are separated from God and who are in a cloud of perplexity in human hum humiliation and sorely tempted. The lost coin represents those who are lost in trespasses and sins, but who have no sense of their condition. They are estranged from God, but they know it not. Their souls are in peril, but they are unconscious and unconcerned. In this parable, Christ teaches that even those who are indifferent to the claims of God are the objects of his pitying love. They are to be sought for that they may be brought back to God. Amen. Thank you. So Dan brought up some good points. I know Sue just read here. Does anything stand out to anyone else? Um, some of the differences or some of the symbolisms between the parables? Well, if nobody else, then I have some dear friends who are very polarized about the lost world. I want to see law and order return. I want to see the righteous vindicated. And, oh, I'm so tired of all this, this, that, and the other thing. And I, it's very hard to say, but, you know, Christ loves everybody. As far as I know, the only one that can't be redeemed right now is Satan. Am, am, I, am I wrong on that? Yeah. 
Yeah, no, that's what I heard Satan, I, even at Ellen White, I think she says in the story of redemption that he was given multiple chances to repent and so were the angels, but they just totally refused. Right. They lost at the cross. That was not yet, right? So, no, you bring up a good point how this is like Jesus loves everyone. Like there's no one that is beyond his love. There is no one that's beyond his efforts. He's putting forth his effort to people that know they're lost, but also to people that don't know they're lost. And Ellen Wynn in particular applied this to our own home lives. Um, this hit home for me. Obviously, I don't have children, but, you know, I, I teach in a classroom. You know, there's children under my care. And this really hit home and several things stuck out to me. So there's actually um, two slides on how we can apply this to our own personal lives. So the first question is, how can this parable relate to our home lives? And then there's several comments on the bottom. Um, if somebody would be willing to read those, you can read all of it or part of it. Uh, but after we read that, then we'll discuss how we can relate it to our own lives. Okay, which ones do you want, Rick? Oh, we'll just start at the top if you don't mind. I think there's like four bullet points. Thank you, Dan. Sure. Um, may God is blessing to the reading of her words. This parable has a lesson to families. In the household, there is often great carelessness concerning the souls of its members. If there is in the families one child who is unconscious of his sinful state, parents should not rest. Let the candle be lighted, search the word of God, and by its light, let everything in the home be diligently examined. Oh, yes. To see why this child is lost, let parents search their own hearts, examine their habits and their practices. Children are the heritage of the Lord, and we are answerable to him for our management of his property. There are fathers and mothers who long to labor in some foreign mission field. There are many who are active in Christian work outside the home, while their own children are strangers to the Savior and his love. But those who have been guilty of neglect are not to despair. Oh, thank you. The woman whose coin was lost searched until she found it. So in love, faith, and prayer, let parents work for their households until with joy they can come to God saying, Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me. Isaiah 18. Isaiah 8, 18. Amen. So I, I had to highlight that part in green because as I was reading this, like my heart just falls because I'm like, how many times have I failed? Like either in my own home or with my siblings or with my cousins or with my students, like how many times have I not searched my own life and because of my example, led other people astray. But I love how in the end she encourages us and she says, those who have been guilty of neglect are not to despair. The woman whose coin was lost searched until she found it. And it was found in the end. So question for you, does anything stick out to you from this passage here? And how can we relate it to our own lives? I think what um, comes to my mind, in not necessarily in relation to the coin, but in relation to this, the prodigal son, um, is that he, even though he even though the prodigal son, you know, his story showed like a specific instance where he left, that process had started at some point before, you know, he might have been ruminating on how am I going to tell my dad I want to leave? How am I going to afford this lifestyle I want to live? So at some point in his mind, that process had started. And then, you know, the Bible records the instance where he actually asked his dad and then he left, you know, a couple of days or whatever later. So I think it also can just apply that you know, someone may be in the home and they may appear to be going through all the motions and everything, but it's still important that even if they may be, appear active for Christ or they may appear to have some type of spirituality, you know, to continue interceding for them and praying for them anyway, because you really don't know necessarily what's in their heart with like, you know, in the case of the prodigal son, um, and then he got up and left. Yeah, it's amazing how many of us are probably here because of praying parents. 
Like I would not be here today if it wasn't for my parents praying for me for 39 years, probably 40 years, because I'm sure they were praying for me when they were expecting. But what's crazy is it, I really don't think I would be here because I can't think of how I would have exposure or even desire to know the truth if it wasn't for the parents, you know, teaching me and praying for me in the home. So take heart, you know, it might take many, many years for that to come to fruition, but eventually it does. And I love this promise at the end, behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me. You know, there's many other Bible verses, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he won't turn from it. And a lot of people get discouraged because they're like, I wasn't walking with Christ. You know, I didn't train up my child. But if you read the rest of this chapter, she says it's not too late. Like many adult children have come to know Christ through the prayers of their older parents. This also speaks to me, Ashley, about prioritization. Mm -hmm. And that is, you know, God first, family second, just on an oversimplified basis. But if you can't keep your house in order, how are you going to go out and and uh, instruct or be a role model for others in helping get their house in order. Mm -hmm. And you have the greatest opportunity right in your own household with the children and the time that you spend with them. And don't lose that opportunity, you get too distracted. Um, it's not to say that you can't, you know, reach out and evangelize, et cetera, but you just got to keep everything in balance. And pretty soon, if you get out of balance, you got to rein that in and pay attention to, you know, what's going wrong at home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I completely echo what you say, because I think somewhere in one of Paul's writings, he talks about qualifications for elders and deacons in the church. And one of the first qualifications is always to have your affairs in order at home, to have your marriage in order, to have your kids in order, because just like what you said, how can you minister to others if you haven't even done that in the home? And even if we don't have children, like I don't have children, or if, you know, if many of you, if your children are already outside of the home, we can still relate this parable to um, our lives outside the home, because it just doesn't refer to people in the home. Um, we can actually apply it to many other spheres of influence as well. So Ellen White has this great quote here. Um, obviously, there's more in the chapter, but I just highlighted one of them here. It says, wherever we may be, there the last piece of silver awaits our search. Are we seeking for it? Day by day, we meet with those who take no interest in religious things. We talk with them. We visit among them. Do we show an interest in their spiritual welfare? Do we present Christ to them as the sin-pardoning Savior? With their own hearts warm the love of Christ, do we tell them about that love? If we do not, how shall we meet these souls, lost, eternally lost, when with them we stand before the throne of God? And that, that really stood out to me because like today I went to get my hair highlighted and I was the girl, you know, I, I could tell she was interested in spiritual matters. So I didn't, I didn't really want to push it. So I'm just praying for her in my head. I leave her like a generous tip because I figure like that's what Christians do. And I kept praying for her. And then I left some literature like outside, you know, looking back, it was something, but it was a little cowardly. Like I wasn't doing the important thing, like to actually, you know, turn that conversation and I, I think it was just laziness on my part. And I think I was just assuming she wasn't interested. So ironically, this was in my mind as I was driving home. So um, I'm just asking for the Lord to redeem that situation. And hopefully she'll touch the literature outside the door. I don't know. But it just definitely reminds me that like, if Jesus is so important to me, I need to start talking about him with other people, even if they don't seem interested. So question for you, because I definitely need some tips here. What are some ways we can share Christ with other people? Well, you want to speak? I just want to say that I really struggle with that myself, because I mean, I have brought up Jesus with a lot of people over the years, but it's not like I'm not seeking in every single solitary conversation I ever have to bring up Jesus. It's like, you know what I mean? It's, we talk about other things sometimes. There's other things going on with these people besides Jesus. Sadly, that's true. You know, I mean, um, 
Oh, um, I think one of the way we can do that, um, and, and this is from experience, even presently, is that um, oftentimes we tell people about Jesus, you know, we tell them about the Bible, but, you know, so often it, it is not evident in how we live, how we treat, treat, um, treat other people, you know. And so when we begin to treat people, you know, be kind to them, be understanding, be patient, uh, be long-suffering, you know, it, it would arouse curiosity, you know, for them to um, in, in investigate or ask you questions like how, you know, why are you so different? What is it that makes you so different? How is it you have this patient? And so now you can introduce them to the author of those things. I agree. You can lead by example. Yeah, and I think that's what uh, that's what Jesus said on the in, on the in the beatitude. He said, "Let your light so shine before men, you know, that they may glorify your Father which is in heaven, that they may see your good works." So you see, we see that um, the fruit have to be evident. When the fruit is evident, then you know you you can genuinely testify of Christ. I think there's also a pretty simple, um, I'm going to say technique, but it's much broader than that. It's a poor choice of words. Um, it's just asking if there's something you can pray for for that individual. I know uh, my wife, Lisa, has a flea market ministry out at, uh, at um, I got a mental blank. Oh, the Shell Factory during the flea market times. And she and a church friend of ours, uh, Jim Bellamy, who's transferring from Punta Gorda to Fort Myers, um, go out there and, and they have a table set up and they, you know, give out literature and Bibles and, and have a prayer list. And uh, I think just talking to people and saying, was there anything that I can pray for you for is kind of, um, I'm going to say a non-confrontational and inviting way to uh, show some care and compassion for somebody else. And that's, I think, duly noted. I think that's great, Jeff. And I think also sometimes we put too much pressure on ourselves. Um, we feel like um, we have to do everything or what we say or what we do has to be really meaningful. And we have to see a um, affirmation in front of our eyes where I'm kind of reminded of Isaiah 55, where it says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts neither are my, your, your ways, my ways, you know, for the heaven is higher than the earth. So are my ways. And we all know that God works in these miraculous ways. And I think he could take our little bit of effort, which might be as simple as just taking a moment after you meet that person and pray for them. And we don't know, and we won't know until we get to heaven of how that impacted that person's life. Mm -hmm. And I know people were praying for my salvation and it worked. So I don't think why we shouldn't pray as well. And I would like to give my wife some kudos for that because there's many times that we may see somebody and um, on the side of the road or obviously under some sort of influence, uh, whether it be drugs or some possession or something. Uh, and, and she will immediately grab my hand and begin to pray for that person. And we don't know. That might be just what was needed to start something, you know. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to provide that little bit of hopefully encouragement. And maybe someone would think about that. Good point. Oh, and if you guys don't know, if you're new here, that's my wonderful husband, Jeff. So... <laughs> Uh, I don't know if you could see the screen, um, but Barb, her um, speaker's not working, but she had a great suggestion here um, in the comments. She said, when people ask us how things are going, rather than answering fine, tell them of something you are studying and how exciting it is. And that's a great point because we have no problems telling people about our new workouts or our travels or like our new job, but why wouldn't we tell them about what we're studying? And we can keep it short and sweet. And if they ask more questions, that's great. And if they don't, that's okay, because we at least tried. So that, that was a great point, Barb. Thank you. And just like Jeff gave some encouragement to the rest of us here, um, Ellen White actually ends the chapter with this beautiful note of encouragement. So if someone would like to read the last paragraph, 
Um, it's the last bullet point. If you could read the whole thing, it's just a really great way to end the parable of the coin. In this work, all the angels of heaven are ready to cooperate. All the resources of heaven are at the command of those who are seeking to save the lost. Angels will help you to reach the most careless and the most hardened. And when one is brought back to God, all heaven is made glad. Seraphs and cherubs touch their golden hearts and sing praises to God and the Lamb for their mercy and loving kindness to the children of men. Amen. Thank you, Brenda. So the coin will just remind us that there are people lost that don't even know they're lost. People in our homes, people in our churches, in the workplace, people that think they're just a good person and that they'll just automatically go to heaven and they might have no understanding of the gospel of their own sinfulness. So just like that coin was eventually found, we need to clean up our own homes and make sure we're doing everything we can to recover that coin. And there's one more parable for the last maybe 15 minutes or so that will hit a note with a lot of people that like to bake. Um, back then, baking traditionally was done by women, not all the time, but um, particularly in Jewish society, men oftentimes worked outside of the home, whereas women stayed within the home. Um, and we can see with a lot of the things that they would bake, these things are now termed ancient grains. So just in case you like to explore health foods and the health benefits of those, I'll send this out to you afterwards. But these are common grains that they would have used back then. My personal favorite, buckwheat or barley, millet, spelt, corn, quinoa. Um, this just gives a little overview of them and some of the antioxidants that are contained in them. And in Bible times, if we look at bread, they ate bread that was prepared in many different ways. Uh, mostly it was made from wheat, barley, spelt, or millet, and it would be seasoned with oil or herbs. Besides the simple round and flat bread, there was other types of breads that were like cakes made with grapes or honey. There was also the unleavened bread, matzah. Maybe you see those matzah crackers at Passover. Um, also pita bread technically is unleavened bread. This is called the bread of haste because um, we can see in the book of Exodus, God told them not to use leaven because leaven was a symbol of sin. They were to get it out of their houses and they were to bake the bread as quickly as possible so that they could run out of Egypt. So that's why traditionally at Passover time, they eat unleavened bread. Um, but if we look at history in general in ancient Israel, nomads generally ate unleavened bread because it was prepared quickly. It didn't take long. You could easily cook it over the fire. Um, however, if you did have a house or permanent residence, unless it was like a Passover or a holy day, you would probably eat leavened bread, bread that was a bit more raised, that was a bit higher because it had a leavening agent in it. And this represented continued, or it represented patience because it was essential for life. Bread was the one food that everybody for the most part ate. That's why Jesus called himself the bread of life. So you can see a cartoon picture of a woman making bread in the top. And on the bottom is someone making bread now, but this is in very much the same methods that they would have used 2000 years ago. I assumed that leaven was yeast, but when I looked up the technical definition, it said leaven is simply the agent that causes a bread or other baked item to rise. It could be a chemical agent like baking powder, or it could be a type of yeast, but basically anything that makes the bread rise. And if we look at the origins of leaven, it's hard to pinpoint what civilization used it. Some people think it was the Babylonians, some people think the Hebrews. Um, but however, a lot of historians think it was probably the ancient Egyptians because you can see a lot of their artwork here, a lot of the um, pictures that are painted inside the tombs and inside the pyramids actually depict people making bread. And what what's interesting about the bread here was when it would first swell, that would cause the ferment, fermentation process. And the Egyptians and then the Sumerians mastered this fermentation process. So a lot of times bread and beer were actually made together. So Jesus didn't really, just, you know, he didn't compare himself to beer, but he did compare himself to bread because it was something pretty much that everyone ate back then. So we're going to briefly look at what is this leaven? Because on the right-hand side, you can see that's the bread most of us are familiar with. That bread obviously had some sort of raising agent in it. 
Whereas the bread on the left-hand side, that would be considered bread that was made in haste, kind of like unleavened bread. So we're going to jump right into it. It's actually only one verse. If someone could read Mark 13, 33, this is the parable of the leaven. Well, I've got it in front of me. Mark 13, 33. Yes, that would be great. Be on guard, be alert. You do not know when that time will come. Oh, I'm so sorry. I, yeah, think... I was trying to figure out how that related to this. <laughs> All right. But it is good advice. <laughs> you are correct. All right, let's do a quick scan. Obviously, I put the wrong passage here. Um... Sorry, that's my trick. It's copyrighted. All right. <laughs> Let's see here. Well, I know it's in Matthew, Mark, or Luke, because John doesn't have any parables. But, um, oh, I can praise the Lord because I would have never found this, but I feel like he prompted me to look at Matthew 13, 33. So I'll read it. Sit this right here in front of me. And this truly is a blessing from God because I would have never found it that quick. Matthew 13, 33. Another parable spake he unto them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. And a lot of people might have wondered, why on earth would Jesus give this parable? Well, Ellen White gives a little bit more about the context of why Jesus did so. So if someone would be willing to read these two bullet points at the bottom, and then we'll talk about what the context to the parable was. I'll read it. Many educated and influential men had come to hear the prophet of Galilee. Some of these looked with curious interest upon the multitude that had gathered about Christ as he taught by the sea. In this great throng, all classes of society were represented. There were the poor, the illiterate, the ragged beggar, the robber with the seal of guilt upon his face, the maimed, dissipated, the merchant and the man of leisure, high and low, rich and poor, all crowding upon one another for a place to stand and hear the words of Christ. As these cultured men gazed upon the strange assembly, they asked themselves, is the kingdom of God composed of such material as this? Again, the Savior replied by a parable, the kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. Thank you. So what insight does Ellen White give us? Like, what is some of the background to this parable? Why do you think Jesus was specifically telling this one? I found it interesting that as these cultured men are looking around them, they see robbers, they see illiterate, they see the poor, they see the beggars. And they're like, how on earth are they going to be part of the kingdom of heaven? And then Jesus jumps right into it. He starts explaining the kingdom of heaven. And he says, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. And if we look at what is this leaven, because if we look at other passages in scripture, which we always should, Luke 12, 1 actually says that leaven is hypocrisy. 1 Corinthians 5, 8 says leaven is malice and wickedness. So in a lot of cases, leaven is not a good thing. That's why when the children of Israel were running out of Egypt, they had to leave the leaven out of their bread because it symbolized sin. However, there can be a dual meaning. And in this case, I'm very happy that Ellen White clarifies. She says, and I'm reading the highlighted in green. But in the Savior's parable, leaven is used to represent the kingdom of heaven. It illustrates the quickening, assimilating power of the grace of God. The leaven, something holy from without, must be put into the meal before the desired change can be wrought in it. So the grace of God must be received by the sinner before he can be fitted for the kingdom of glory. So in this case, what does the leaven represent? Word of God. Yep. 
Amen. The word of God, the grace of God, the Holy Spirit, because the bread will not rise without it. And we as Christians will not grow without the word of God, without the Holy Spirit. And she gives us a lot of counsel about the leaven because a lot of people assume they have the leaven in their lives. You know, we may be some of them, but she encourages us to examine ourselves. And this is what she says. She says, as the leaven, when mingled with the meal, works from without, works from within outward, so it is by the renewing of the heart that the grace of God works to transform the life. No mere external change is sufficient to bring us into harmony with God. There are many who try to reform by correcting this or that bad habit, and they hope in this way to become Christians, but they are beginning in the wrong place. Our first work is with the heart. A profession of faith and the possession of truth in the soul are two different things. The mere knowledge of truth is not enough. We may possess this, but the tenor of our thoughts may not be changed. The heart must be converted and sanctified. So even though we might look like Christians, if we don't have the word of God, if we don't have the grace of God, if we don't have the Holy Spirit, then there's going to be no growth. And I know sometimes I want to like look at myself and see like, am I growing? Because I don't feel like I'm growing. But the good news is there is actually some ways that you can look at yourself to see if you have 11 in your heart. So there's two um, bullet points at the bottom. If somebody would be willing to read those, this will tell us that there is some evidence that leaven is working in our lives. I can read. The Thank leaven you. hidden in the flour works invisibly to bring the whole mass under its leavening process. So the leaven of truth works secretly, silently, steadily to transform the soul. The natural inclinations are softened and are subdued. New thoughts, new feelings, new motives are implanted. A new standard of character is set up, the life of Christ. The mind is changed. The faculties are aroused to action in new lines. Man is not endowed with new faculties, but the faculties he has are sanctified. The conscience is awakened. We are endowed with the traits of the character that enable us to do the service for God. Amen. So I know it can be discouraging because I know when I look at my life, I'm like, wow, there is some stuff I've been working on forever and it doesn't seem like I'm making progress. And it can be very discouraging, especially if you're reading through like certain volumes of the testimonies and it seems like every page is talking about a sin that you're struggling with. But the good news is that if we look at how we were and how we are now, we can still see that God is faithfully working through our lives. And she gives some indicators here. Um, what are some things that we can look for to know if God is working in our lives? Examine our thoughts and actions. Yeah, if you notice that your natural inclinations are being subdued, just like what Jeff said, if you notice that you're having new thoughts, new feelings, new motives, if you notice that you're becoming more sensitive, maybe things that didn't used to bother you are bothering you now, or maybe you don't even say rude things, but if you think them and you feel horrible about it, that's actually a good thing. It means the spirit of Christ is working upon you. It means that leaven is working in your life. So like the same favorite sins aren't quite as fun anymore. Yeah. Yeah, I look Golly, back. Gomer. I know I look back at some of the things I used to enjoy and I'm like horrified. I'm like, how <laughs> on earth could I have enjoyed that? And but I praise God for that because clearly I've had a change of heart. And there's still a lot of other things I need to be horrified of. But thankfully, I think it was Martin Luther. Sometimes they attribute quotes to people that didn't say them, but I heard it was attributed to Martin Luther that said, I may not be the man I want to be. But thank God I'm not the thank God I'm not the man I was. It doesn't really sound like his language, so I don't know if he said it, but I thought that was a really good quote. You know, obviously we're not perfect, but if we look back at who we were and who we are now, I think we can all see that God has been working in our life. Almost something like Churchill would have said. Only yeah. different. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to me, these two bullet points are analogous to someone being reborn with their uh Belief and faith in Christ as our Savior. 
It's a new person. Mm -hmm. That's a great connection because I think in the chapter she connects it to Nicodemus and how Jesus told him he needed to be reborn. So that's like an amazing connection to this because that's clearly characteristic of what it's like to be reborn. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Does oh, it does it make any sense that the closer we get to, to Christ, the more we feel like dirt every day? Does that make any sense at all? I'll let you guys go first. Does that make sense to you guys? Well, I think... Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I think maybe we just become more sensitive to our sins and maybe yeah. of the sins of our past. And um, we're remorseful. But like Ashley said, I think that's a good thing. Um, so... I think that's if we didn't feel that, then we wouldn't feel the need for Christ. Good point. Thank you, Jeff. You know, as we close up here, we have maybe about like two minutes or so. Uh, maybe we'll just sum up the parables really quick because I know that there's probably different things that stand out to of different group members. Um, but if someone would like to share, the first two questions are, how would you summarize the parable of the coin and what does it teach us? Does anybody want to share what stood out to them about the parable of the coin? Well, to me, it says everybody's important and even those that don't know their loss need our prayers and attention. Amen. That was a great summary. So the next one we'll do is how do you summarize the parable of the, I put yeast, technically it should be leaven, but in my head, as I prepared this, it was yeast. And then I learned the definitions broader. So how would you summarize the parable of the leaven? And what does that teach us? Well, I, I look at it as that the God of word, uh, the, the love of God is in us, mm -hmm. but we need to have the Holy Spirit expand mm -hmm. our knowledge and our understanding and mm -hmm. increase us in our uh, worship of the Lord. Amen. And to me, within us means in our heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I also like the parable of the fact that both are um, work silently and primarily are unseen, but yet produce um, valuable fruits, I guess, or something in the end. Well, you guys did an amazing job wrapping that up. Um, I know it's always helpful to me when I hear from someone else how they would describe it, because then it just cements it in my head so that I can better understand it. So thank you very much for coming out. Um, thank you for taking the time on a Monday night. And if you are so interested, next week we'll actually dive into some of the working class parables because back then very few people were rich. Most people worked from sunup to sundown and Jesus made sure that he addressed them in his parables as well. So we'll be doing that next week. Um, in the invite email, it says like what chapters we'll be highlighting. You don't have to read it ahead of time, but if you would like to, um, the specific chapters will be there. So in closing, I'm just going to stop the recording because I do want to be able to pray in confidential